You're listening to Gullum Institute's podcast series, Sira, Life of the Prophet, by Sheikh Abdul Nasir Jangda. Visit us on the web at gullaminstitute.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash gullaminstitute. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Inshallah, continuing with our series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Masiratu Nabawiya. Previously, uh, we kind of left off in the somewhat the middle of a topic. What we were talking about in the previous session was the after we discussed in the last few sessions actually the beginning of revelation and the immediate aftermath. And in fact, we talked about the first few revelations upon the Prophet sallallahu We then moved on to talk about some of the, er, the early community of Islam, if you will, the early Muslims, the early converts to Islam. And in the course of that, of course, at detail, at length, we talked about Khadija radiallahu anha, Khadija bint Khuwailid radiallahu anha, the beloved wife of the Prophet sallallahu the mother of the believers. And we pretty much dedicated the previous session solely to talking about her. At the end of the previous session, we started to talk about who is basically dubbed or who is um, uh, considered to be rather, I should say, the second convert to Islam, who was Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. Ali, the son of Abu Talib, who was the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ. Of course, there was a large age gap, a large age difference between the two. And just to kind of rehash and kind of get us back up to speed where we left off, what we talked about last time was Ali radiallahu anhu, there are different narrations. Some say he was seven, some say he was nine, some narrations say he was ten. Asahu riwayat, the more authentic narrations, and majority of the scholars of Sirah seem to be... Uh, leaning towards the fact and pretty much seemed to be in agreement uh, with the fact that he was 10 years old at the time of the beginning of Revelation. The situation that I talked about that I'll quickly, briefly summarize here is that the Prophet of Allah when he was at this age of 40, the Prophet ﷺ, of course, was a businessman. He was married to Khadija radiallahu anha, who was a very, very, mashallah, successful businesswoman. And he, along with his uncle Abbas radiallahu anhu, uh, who was also well to do, he had not, of course, accepted Islam at this point. We're talking very early on. In fact, we were talking about the before revelation. Abbas radiallahu anhu was also well to do. So what ended up happening and transpiring at that time was the Prophet ﷺ went with Abbas radiallahu anhu to Abu Talib. Abu Talib, who was a leader of the tribe, managing the affairs of the family and the tribe. But at the same time, Abu Talib was a very simple man and a man with very limited financial means. Because of this, they went to Abu Talib and they said, why don't you let us help you out a little bit? Basically, let us you know, take care of some of your younger children. So we'll take care of them financially, we can house them in our homes as well, and we can help you out a little bit as a family. And I talked about how this shows the social family consciousness of the Prophet ﷺ, that he was someone who was very attuned, he was somebody who was very considerate and very concerned about his family affairs, and he kept up with what was going on with family members. So. Ja'far radiallahu anhu, Ja'far bin Abi Talib was given into the care of Abbas, the uncle Abbas. While Ali bin Abi Talib, Ali the youngest son, who was you know probably six, seven years old at this time, was given into the care of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he lived in the home of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for a few years. That's when the beginning of revelation occurred. Now, what we talked about last time was how did Ali radiallahu anhu accept Islam? How did he convert? So we had talked about in the story of Khadija that Khadija radiallahu anha used to pray with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They would pray together. And I talked about how this, this established the base of a family. Not just the family, but the spiritual foundations of a family, establishing family and spirituality simultaneously. And they both go hand in hand. They would pray together. And Ali radiallahu anhu, some of the narrations say that the revelation started on a Monday. And I talked about this in the very beginning sessions of the seerah, when we talked about the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, that the Prophet ﷺ was given prophethood, he was given his mission on Monday, on a Monday. So the revelation began on a Monday, and some of the narrations of the seerah say that Ali radiallahu anhu, صلى مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يوم الثلاثاء. 
that by Tuesday, Ali radiallahu anhu was a Muslim and praying with the Prophet sallallahu So some of the narrations say he accepted Islam the very next day. By the, by, as soon as a day had passed, he was already a Muslim. So what basically happened was that the Prophet ﷺ came back, Khadija radiallahu anha accepted Islam immediately, and they began to pray together. Now Ali radiallahu anhu lives in the same home. A 10 year old boy, a very intelligent, a very bright 10 year old boy. So there's really not much you can get by a very smart, intelligent, bright, observant 10 year old. So he immediately saw them praying and he said, what is this? What are you doing? And we talked about the narration that he told the, that the Prophet ﷺ told him, and, and I talked about the narration detail that the Prophet ﷺ explains to him what he's doing. He didn't say, oh, it's a child, go, 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 we're doing something, go, go, go. He didn't dismiss him. He was a child. We often discuss, we talk, we ask about how to educate our own children about Islam. Well, the Prophet ﷺ teaches us. He explained it to him. Deenullah ladhi istafa li nafsihi. وَبَعَثَ بِهِ رُسُلَهُ فَأَدْعُوكَ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَإِلَىٰ عِبَادَتِهِ وَكُفْرٍ بِاللَّاتِ وَالْعُزَّةِ That the Prophet ﷺ said, this is a religion that Allah has chosen for Himself. And He has sent His messengers with this religion. So I call you to Allah alone. There are no partners for Him. And I call you to worship Allah alone. And I call you to denounce these idols that everyone else worships, like Allah wal Uzza. Ali ibn Abi Talib, it shows you his intelligence. And when you engage even a child in an intelligent discussion, the child can oftentimes surprise you. He said, هَذَا أَمْرٌ لَمْ أَسْمَعْ بِهِ قَبْلِ الْيَوْمِ This is something I've never heard about ever before. فَلَسْتُ بِقَادٍ أَمْرًا حَتَّى أُحَدِّثَ بِهِ أَبَا طَالِبٍ So I really can't tell you anything. I can't really tell you what I feel about it until I first talk to and consult my father, Abu Talib. The Prophet ﷺ, because of the delicate stage of the message that it was in, the Prophet ﷺ told Ali radiallahu anhu that if you don't want to accept this message, I completely understand. I just prefer that you don't talk about it to anyone else right now, just because it's not the right time yet. So Ali radiallahu anhu respected the wishes of the Prophet ﷺ. Ali radiallahu anhu says that, I basically waited one night. I waited one night. And in that night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the truth of Islam into my heart. So he went in the morning to the Prophet ﷺ the next morning, and he said, مَاذَا عَرَطَ عَلَيَّ يَا مُحَمَّدْ what, what do you propose I do, O Muhammad? So the Prophet ﷺ said, تَشْهَدُ أَن لَا إِلَهَ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَتَكْفُرْ بِاللَّاتِ وَالْعُزَّةِ وَتَبْرَأُ مِنَ الْأَنْدَادِ I propose that you bear witness and give testimony that there is no one worthy of worship but Allah alone. He has no partners. You denounce these idols, Allah wal Uzza, and you basically distance yourself from all the other things that people worship other than Allah. Ali radiallahu anhu complied and accepted Islam. And this is how Ali radiallahu anhu became Muslim. Now, Ali radiallahu anhu was fearful of what the response of his father would be. He was afraid, he was fearful, as any child would be. Adults would be. So he wasn't sure what his father would say, how he would respond, how he would react as a child. So he decided to keep it secret, to keep it quiet. And it actually says that he waited. Normally he would, you know, pr pretty much every single day go home and visit his parents and things like that. But he actually stayed for a few weeks without visiting back home. Just, you know, saying I've been very busy doing this, doing that. He actually went a few weeks because he was so nervous about telling his father. Some of the narrations even say that Ali radiallahu anhu accepted Islam a year after revelation began. A year later. But this is something that is rejected. Because we have other narrations that tell us that the very next day he was Muslim. How do we reconcile the two? Because Ali radiallahu anhu being a child, kept his Islam very very quiet. As a child to begin with, he didn't have like a lot of public interaction with other adults. So there was really no way for anyone to know that he accepted Islam. And on top of that, being a child, he kept his Islam more quiet, more private. So it was only a year later till people actually realized that Ali radiallahu anhu had joined the ranks of these believers and these Muslims. So now, what exactly happened? So the narration says that Ali radiallahu anhu, there's actually a narration that I'll, I'll mention here. 
It's a very popularly mentioned narration, mentioned in many of the books of Sirah, Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, many of the books of Sirah, that Ufayf, who was a man at that time, he was the brother of Al-Ash'ath bin Qais, who was a very powerful leader in Arabia at that time. He says that, كُنْتُ إِمْرَأً تَاجِرًا فَقَدِمْتُ مِنَا أَيَّامَ الْحَجِّ I was a businessman, so I came to Mina during the season of Hajj to do business. That was a marketplace, so I came to do business. وَكَانَ Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib imra'an tajiran. So Abbas, the son of Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet was also a businessman. فَأَتَيْتُهُ أَبْتَاعُ مِنْهُ وَأَبِيعُهُ I came to kind of do some business with him, sell him some stuff, buy some stuff from him, do some trading with him. فَبَيْنَا نَحْنُ إِذْ خَرَجَ رَجُلٌ مِنْ خِبَاءٍ So while we were sitting there, a man came out from a tent. فَقَامَ يُصَلِّي تِجَاهَ الْكَعْبَةِ So he, start, he faced in the direction of the Kaaba and he started to pray. ثُمَّ خَرَجَتْ إِمْرَأَةٌ فَقَامَتْ تُصَلِّي A woman came out and started to pray with him. And the narration, more other narrations which are all compiled here, say that he, this woman came out and stood behind the Prophet ﷺ and began to pray along with him. وَخَرَجَ غُلَامٌ فَقَامَ يُصَلِّي مَعَهُ and a boy came out and stood to the right of the Prophet ﷺ, بِيَمِينِهِ and started to pray with him. And that should sound very familiar to us. That if it's two people praying, two men praying, then you stand to the right. The, the follower stands to the right. The leader stands on the left. And a woman would stand behind. And so this is how they started to pray. And they were all praying, فَقُلْتُ يَا عَبَّاسِ so there are two narrations. One says that he questioned him. He said, "Ma have a deen? What are these people doing? What is this religion?" Abbas radiAllahu anhu said, "Inna had a deen ma nadri ma huwa." Oh no, excuse me. The man says that this religion I see these people practicing. I, I don't know what it is. It's not familiar to us. فَقَالَ هَذَا مُحَمَّدُ بْنُ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ يَزْعَمُ أَنَّ اللَّهَ أَرْسَلَهُ. Abbas radiAllahu anhu said that this is Muhammad ibn Abdullah. He presumes that Allah has sent him as a messenger. وَإِنَّ كُنُوزَ كِسْرَ وَقَيْسَرَ سَيَفْتَحُ عَلَيْهِ And he says that the treasures of the emperors of Rome and Persia will be opened for him and his followers. وَهَذِهِ إِمْرَةُ خَدِيجَةُ بْنُ خُوَيْلِدْ آمَنَتْ بِهِ This is his wife Khadija, رضي الله عنها, may Allah be pleased with her, who has believed in him and follows him. وَهَذِ الْغُلَامِ إِبْنُ عَمِّهِ عَلِي بِنَ بِي طَالِبْ فَآمَنَ بِهِ And this boy that you see praying with him, this is his cousin from his uncle. Ali bin Abi Talib, who has also believed in him. فَقَالَ عُفَيْف Ufayf basically says, فَلَيْتَنِي كُنْتُ آمَنْتُ يَوْمَ إِذٍ فَكُنْتُ أَكُونَ ثَانِيًا He says, I wish I would have believed on that day. Because then I would have been the second man, like the second believer. There was a child and a woman, he says, if only I would have understood that day, I could have been the second person. I could have been one of the early people to believe. Another narration very similar to this, Basically says that same narration from Ufayf. This is narrated by Ibn Jarir al Tabari. He says that the Prophet ﷺ came out, face towards the Qibla, towards face towards the Kaaba, towards the Kaaba, and he started to pray. The boy came and started to pray to the right of him. The woman came and stood behind him and started to pray. And then it describes the prayer. And I talked about this in the previous session. We oftentimes assume, we, we perceive, we connect the prayer with Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. What we fail to understand is that the five times, the daily five times, Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, that was at the time of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. But Salah was from the very beginning. Salah was something the previous prophets prayed. It talks about Ismail alayhi salam in Surah number 19, Surah Maryam, وَكَانَ يَأْمُرُ أَهْلَهُ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالزَّكَاةِ Maryam was told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَاسْجُدِي وَرْكَعِي مَعَ الرَّاكِعِينَ Banu Israel was told, وَرْكَعُ مَعَ الرَّاكِعِينَ So Salah was prayed previously, even very similar to the format in which we pray it. So he describes, فَرَكَعَ الشَّابِ فَرَكَعَ الْغُلَامُ وَالْإِمْرَأَ So the man went into ruku' and the young boy and the woman went into ruku' with him. فَرَفَعَ الشَّابِ فَرَفَعَ الْغُلَامُ وَالْمَرْأَ so the man then stood up after ruku and the child and the woman stood up with him. فَخَرَّ الشَّابُ سَاجِدًا فَسَجَدَ مَعَهُ فَسَجَدَ مَعَهُ And then the man fell into sujood, put his face on the ground, and both of them, the man and the woman, also went into sujood along with him. So then he says, يَا عَبَّاسِ أَمْرٌ عَظِيمٌ He said, Abbas, this is really remarkable. What, what's going on here? أَمْرٌ عَظِيمٌ 
فقال أتدري من هذا؟ So Abbas asked me, he goes, do you know who this is? He said, no, I don't know. He said, هذا محمد بن عبد محمد بن عبد الله بن عبد المطلب ابن أخي. This is my ne- this is my nephew. Abbas said, this is my nephew, Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, the son of Abdul Muttalib. He said, do you know who the, the boy is? He said, no, I don't know. He said, هذا علي بن أبي طالب. I mean, he's related to me as well. Then he said that, do you know who the woman is? He said, of course I don't. He said, this is Khadija bint Khuwailid, Zawdatu ibn Akhi. This is the wife of my nephew here. This is his wife. وَهَذَا حَدَّثَنِي أَنَّ رَبَّكَ رَبَّ السَّمَاءِ أَمَرَهُ بِهَذَا الَّذِي تَرَهُمْ عَلَيْهِ And he says that your Lord, the Lord of the sky, He's the one who's commanded him to do what you see them doing. وَإِيمُ اللَّهِ مَا أَعْلَمُ عَلَى ظَهْرِ الْأَرْضِ كُلُّهَا كُلَّهَا أَحَدًا عَلَى هَذَا الدِّينِ غَيْرَ هَؤُلَاءِ الثَّلَاثَةَ And he says, I swear by Allah, I don't know anyone other than these three who is worshipping according to this religion today. I don't know anyone other than these three who follows this religion today. So it shows you how early this was. And that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so one thing that I wanted to talk about, I wanted to address about, wanted to address basically as a reflection based on this, is it's very important to understand how and what, you know, the Prophet sallallahu did with people who accepted Islam. First and foremost, let's talk about the child. I talked about it in previous session, about as a family. That the Prophet ﷺ prayed with Khadija radiallahu anha. And they prayed together. And that, that, that solidified their base. That, that, that was quality time, a quality activity that they engaged in together. To pray as a family. Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu is basically a member of the family, but on top of that, the child. Again, what does the Prophet ﷺ do with the child? They pray together. They, they pray together. And so it's very, very important that we learn this lesson from the very early days. One of the first things that the Prophet ﷺ instilled and acted, he demonstrated was for us to pray together as families. To pray with our wives, to pray with our children, to pray together as a home and a family. This is from, directly from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ at the most delicate and fragile of times. The beginning of revelation. Abbas was saying, I don't know anyone else on this earth aside from these three who follow this religion of Muhammad. I don't know anyone other than Muhammad, his wife Khadija, and this boy in their care, Ali. That's it. But they prayed together. So we talk about preserving our deen, preserving our religion, salah, is very important in that regard. And of course, to not take it for granted, what's important in terms of engaging in that salah is teaching them how to pray. Not just the ritualistic aspect of prayer. Not just a ritualistic aspect of prayer, but make prayer something. We saw how the Prophet ﷺ engaged Ali radiallahu anhu in intelligent dialogue. A ten-year-old boy, he's explaining the religion to him. So explain to your children, teach them how to pray properly. Teach them what to read and what it means when they read it. And then praying together as a family. The other thing I wanted to talk about, and we'll see this in the following narrations when we go on to talk about some of the other early uh, converts to Islam. The very first activity, the very first act, the very first activity, the very first education that the Prophet ﷺ would engage a new convert to Islam in, the very first thing he engaged him in was prayer. Praying with them. Now obviously if somebody just accepted Islam, then you can't just say, alright, aqim is salah. Allahu Akbar. I mean, it doesn't work like that. You have, to, you have to tell them, okay, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna pray like this, and then we do this, and then we read that, and then we read this, and this is what that means, and this is what this means, and this is how we do this, and this is how we do that. And you gotta teach them, right? To be able to pray with them. What we see right here is the very first thing the Prophet ﷺ would engage a new convert in was salah. It was salah, it was the prayer. And in order to engage him in prayer, he had to teach them how to pray. So the very first thing he taught them was salah. The very first thing he taught them was prayer. Now compare that to how we, as a community, let alone individuals, but even as a community, where you would figure at least the foolishness of individuals is overcome oftentimes by the collective. But a lot of times, unfortunately, it, the foolishness of individuals can be compounded as, as a collective. What do we as a community engage a new convert to Islam in? Where is the first piece of information we impart to them? Where is the very first thing we tell them to do? was the very first thing. I mean, and, and this is a topic that's been covered 
But nevertheless, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt for us to kind of intelligently from the seerah take this into consideration. I mean, we, we've probably all heard the horror stories. Maybe unfortunately, we've been unfortunate enough to even witness some of them. From everything to talking, asking them if they're married. Well, did your husband, did your wife accept this some? No, that's it. You have to leave them. Like really? I just said the shahada five minutes ago. And now you're telling me that I have to just give up my whole life? Changing their name, growing a beard, put this hijab on, you have to wear a thobe, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to go and get circumcised. Right? Like <laughs> pretty much anything and everything you can imagine. I'm not trying to mock any of these things. Khatna is from the sunnah of all the Anbiya. No, we can't make fun of any of those things. But there is a time and a place and a process of everything. You can't tell a grown man five minutes after he just accepted Islam that, hey, by the way, snip, snip. I mean, that's, that's, what do you, what do you, you, that's, it's terrifying. Just the prospect of it is terrifying. From everything to, I have friends. From when I was a young boy, I was a teenager, I used to go to the masjid. I remember other young teenagers, high schoolers, coming in, accepting Islam. When it was very, very rare, it was very rare, it didn't occur very commonly, very often. And the first thing they're being told is, so your parents, you know, they're, they're, they're now, you have to understand your parents are kuffar, and all the food they eat is haram. And so what you're gonna have to do is, and this kid, it's a 14 year old kid who just accepted Islam. And so you have to understand. You know, the very first thing the Prophet ﷺ did with a new convert to Islam, was give them a relationship with Allah. There are ahkam. There are. For anyone who's getting bent out of shape by this, oh, what are you trying to say? We're not supposed to tell them to practice? Nobody said that. But there's a process. There's a process. The very first thing they need is they need a relationship with Allah. And salah is that relationship, is the base, is the foundation of that relationship with Allah. Oh, but that's really difficult. Because now somebody who's never read a lick, a word of Arabic ever before in their entire lives, for them to be able to pray is gonna take a lot of teaching. It's gonna take a lot of time, it's gonna take hours and hours, days and days to teach them how to pray. Even the arkan, even the physical movements will take forever, let alone what you read, let alone what it means. Well yeah, exactly, that's the point. So how many of us individually, how many of us as a community are willing to take out days of our lives Take out three, the next three days, the next week, for two hours a day, let me take out time every single day to teach this person how to pray. How many of us are willing to do that? I haven't even touched on the issue where we start to ideologically like grapple. It's like, it's like a loose ball on the football field, it's like a fumble. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all of us as an ummah and as a community. The most horrible thing I've ever seen is when somebody accepts Islam and everybody in the community who has an, a particular ideological affiliation, basically sees a fumble. Basically sees a loose ball on the football field. Whoever picks up the ball, it's theirs. They get possession of the football. So now let me convert him over to my side. وَلَعَيَاذُ billah, Islam is our side. And this person already converted to Islam. That's the most terrible thing. That's, I'm not even gonna touch on that. Because that shouldn't even have to be touched on. That's how disgusting that is. But as a community, how many of us, do we have a system in place? Okay, individually, how many of us are willing to embrace this brother, embrace this sister, invite them over to our home, make them feel like they're part of the family, and then put in quality time to teach them how to pray? Oh, it's very tedious work. Very tedious work. Allahu Akbar, huh? Allahu Akbar, huh? It's very tedious work. But how many of us are willing to put in that time? Let alone everything else that comes along. Okay, fine, individually, we're all busy, we all got a lot going on. We're really busy, we got a lot going on. Even though, yes, some of those things are good things, they're responsibilities. But there comes a certain point in time where we, I can't really yell at you for that. I have to go and look, at the, look in the mirror myself, and I have to really check myself. If I like to call myself a Muslim, and Islam, and a Da'i, and a caller to the religion, then let's make some sacrifice. Let's put in the time. Okay, fine, individually we can. As a community, do we have a system in place? We have a fantastic system to organize a potluck. We got Google documents and email lists and Facebook groups. Oh, you want to do a potluck? We can get it together in 10 minutes flat. 
We can arrange a potluck in 10 minutes. And we'll have every type of international potluck day. We'll have food from 18 different countries. Can't we have a system in place to educate somebody who just accepted Islam on how to pray salah? We, we can't? We don't have a system? This was the, this was the Prophet ﷺ's first concern. Khadija radiallahu anha accepted Islam, let's pray together. Let me teach you how to pray. Ali bin Abi Talib, a 10 year old boy accepts Islam, come on son, let's go pray. Let me teach you how to pray, let's pray together. And they all stand up and they all pray together. So much so that the early exposure to Islam, even the close family members of the Prophet ﷺ are realizing that they've accepted Islam, that this religion is growing, that this, the religion that they're preaching and learning and teaching to one another, by means of them praying. That's how they're all understanding, that's how they're all realizing. That's how they're all finding out exactly what's going on. So anyways, to continue on, the next person to accept Islam was Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was the next one to accept Islam. There's a very, again, I kind of read this from a collection of, uh, I read this from a book of Sirah. I'll similarly read um, what some of the classical historians, what the, some of the scholars have written in the books of Sirah about, from the Tariq of Tabari, excuse me, it's mentioned in the Tariq of Tabari in another books of Sirah, how it describes the Islam of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. وَأَوَّلُ مَنْ أَسْلَمَ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ الْأَحْرَارُ أَبُو بَكَرْ الصِّدِّيقِ radiallahu anhu. Actually, before I talk about the Islam of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, I almost forgot, I almost overlooked this detail. The, the next person to accept Islam. According to many of the scholars and historians who have reconciled a lot of the narrations. You have to understand, some of the narrations are saying, no, the first one was Ali. Some are saying first one was Khadija. Some are saying the first one was Abu Bakr. Some of them are saying the first one was Zayd ibn Haritha. Because basically, from the chains where they got them, who was the first person that someone was exposed to? Their Islam they were exposed to. But many of the scholars and historians have reconciled all of them. And the sequence they give us is, the third person to accept Islam was Zayd ibn Haritha. Radiallahu anhu. Zayd bin Haritha, his very briefly, his story is that he, Zayd, the son of Haritha, he was a young boy, his father was a leader of a tribe, and he had gone out, just kind of wandered a little bit away from home as a boy, um, playing or, you know, doing whatever, exploring whatever little boys, you know, they kind of wander away from home doing. And there was a caravan, there were some people kind of passing by, there must have been some bad people. So they see a boy kind of wandering around on his own, so they snatched them up. Human trafficking basically. This is pre-Islam. A lot of these, a lot of the zulm uh, existed at that time, unfortunately, like it does in the world today as well. So he got snatched up, he got kidnapped, he got picked up, and got brought to Mecca and sold as a slave. He was sold as a slave to, some of the narrations say, one of the cousins of Khadija radiallahu anha bought him as a slave, Hakim bin Hizam, who later on gave him to Khadija radiallahu anha as a gift, some of the narrations say at the time of her marriage to the Prophet ﷺ. After some time, Khadija radiallahu anha basically gave him to the Prophet ﷺ. Husband and wife, they pretty much shared everything that they had, but nevertheless, she pretty much gave him to the Prophet ﷺ because he saw that he was a very good boy and the Prophet ﷺ pretty much would treat him like a son would treat him like a child, and he would tr go around with the Prophet he would, he would take him with him on business, he would take him on, with him to run errands, kind of like how you would take your younger brother or your son with you pretty much everywhere you go. And so Khadija radiallahu anha saw that they had de developed like this father-son type of relationship, so she pretty much said, you do with him whatever you want, I don't consider him a slave of mine anymore, it's your decision whatever you do with him. And Shortly after revelation came, and Khadija radiallahu anha and Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu are praying with the Prophet ﷺ, Zayd bin Haritha was also exposed to this. He also asked the Prophet ﷺ exactly what is going on, and accepted Islam and joined in to them, praying with them. And the narrations actually talk about this. Now, shortly thereafter, um, it, as simultaneously there's another story going on. So while this whole story in Mecca is playing out, there's another story going on. The other story going on is, Zayd bin Haritha radiallahu anhu, his father Haritha is looking for him. He's searching for his son, he's looking for his son, desperately trying to find his son. He, he was very beloved to him, he was very attached to him, and he's desperately trying to find his son and locate exactly where he went and what happened to him and what transpired with him. And it even mentions some poetry that he used to recite basically, longing for him, calling for him, searching for him. 
And eventually it said that his poetry was so powerful, it was so famous, um, that it actually kind of caught on. It became popularly known, it got caught on, and people heard about this, and the story of this man named Haritha looking for his son named Zayd kind of became a little bit of a legend. It kind of, became, it kind of went viral, if you will. Like what we would say going viral, it went viral. This famous, this very epic story of this you know, father, this, this emotionally tormented father, Haritha, looking desperately for his son, beloved son Zayd. This story went viral. So much so that the news reached Mecca. And when the news reached Mecca, then some of the people in Mecca recognized, okay, this boy is Aid. I wonder if this is the boy. And some people asked him, do you remember your dad's name? And he goes, yeah, my, I'm from the, originally I was from here. And this is what happened to me. And I think my dad's name was Haritha. This, this, this. He told them. And the news reached back to his father that we found your son, he's in Mecca. Now the dad and the uncle came rushing to Mecca. Came rushing to Mecca, first thing. To basically scoop up the son and take him back home. When they arrived in Mecca, they found out, okay, he's in the care of a man named Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. They approached the Prophet sallallahu with great praises. Great praises. And the Prophet sallallahu of course, even being deserving of them. They said, you are the grandson of Abdul Muttalib, our great leader. I've talked about this in some of the early, excuse me, some of the early Sira sessions, how Abdul Muttalib was like this legendary leader of, the, of all of Arabia. He was admired, he was looked up to. So they said, you're the grandson of Abdul Muttalib. You come from noble lineage. And we've heard only good things about you. They call you a sadiq al-ameen here in your city. Please return our son to us. Let him come back home with us. We realize that he was a slave that was given to you. We will pay you whatever you want. We just want to take our son back home. And the Prophet ﷺ moved by the father's emotions. He said, I'll do, I'll do one better for you. But at the same time, the Prophet ﷺ understanding who Zayd was, what was in Zayd's heart, and also understanding and realizing the relationship that they had developed. He said, I, I'll do one better than you. I'll give you something better. I will call Zayd, and I will let him do whatever he wants. I won't only just hand him back over to you. I'll let Zayd make the decision. By this time, some of the narrations mentioned Zayd radiallahu anhu to be like a teenager, basically a man at this point. So he said, I'll let Zayd decide what he wants to do. So Zayd radiallahu anhu was called. And he said that, is this your father? Is this your uncle? And he said, yes, I recognize him. That's my dad, that's my uncle. And of course, you know, they must have embraced and reacquainted themselves and made sure everybody was okay. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, Zayd, son, we got a matter we have to settle. They're here to take you back home. I've told them, you're a young man now. I'm gonna let you do whatever you want. I'm gonna let you decide whatever you want to do. And he said, I would like to stay here with Muhammad Rasulullah ﷺ. His father said, son, you're a slave. You'll choose slavery over your family? You choose slavery over your family? He said, Father, I have seen something. I've experienced something with this man, Muhammad Rasulullah that I will not find anywhere else in this world. Of course, he was talking about Islam, prophethood, nubuwa, risala, Qur'an, wahi. He said, I've found something here that, is, that I won't find anywhere else. I value what I have here. I'm very grateful to be able to see you and meet you and let you know I'm okay and know that you're okay. But I don't want to leave the company of Muhammad So the father, seeing this, uh, trying to understand it, but distraught, as you can imagine, the Prophet was so concerned about the father's emotional plight, but also so moved but the iman of Zayd radiallahu anhu, that the Prophet ﷺ called Zayd, he embraced him, and he said, don't worry. Ya Haritha, don't worry. From here on out today, he's not my slave, he's my son. I not only free him from slavery, from the bonds of slavery, but I embrace him as a son, I adopt him as my own. And he became known as Zayd bin Muhammad from that day on. And this is the story of Zayd radiallahu anhu's acceptance of Islam. And the father being very happy, must have stayed for a few days, reconnected with Zayd radiallahu anhu, and eventually went back home and was very content to leave him with the Prophet because now he knew he was left 
with family. That Zayd radiallahu anhu was safe and he was okay because he was amongst family. This is something that we'll talk about later in the seerah. So I don't want to jump ahead of myself. But what does oftentimes get brought up here in the books of seerah is some of the rules and regulations that would be revealed later in the Medinan period um, about adoption. That basically, أُدْعُوهُمْ لِآبَائِهِمْ هُوَ أَقْسَطُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would later send down the command, the revelation in Surah Al-Ahzab that call them by their father's name because that is more fair and just in the eyes and the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What that means is that if a child who has been adopted, his lineage is known, then you should not change his lineage. So he was Zayd bin Haritha, and that was known that he was Zayd the son of Haritha. So he should not be called Zayd the son of Muhammad, he should be called Zayd the son of Haritha. He should be called that. Some, some, you know, a lot of the er, uh, early translations of the seerah or of books of fiqh or even books of tafsir to the English language. So I'm not talking about classical, I'm talking about, you know, a hundred years ago, 50, 60 years ago, a hundred years ago, 150 years ago. When a lot of the classical material was starting to be translated over to the English language. A lot of it was done a couple of hundred years back was done by Orientalists who were not fully familiar with the Islamic tradition. We're not familiar, well versed in Islamic law completely, from a classical perspective. Or it was done by professors of the English language, who were found in places like Egypt, and India, and in other places, parts of the Muslim world. Some of these translations, the last hundred years, 50, 60 years, was done by people who were professors of, or translators of the English language, and they translated into the English language. What happened as a consequence of this, what happened because of these factors was some early books of tafsir. If you read the tafsir of Surah Al-Ahzab in these early English translations, if you read um, early books of uh, early translations of Sira, English language, or some books of fiqh that were classical books of fiqh that were translated into the English language, you find a huge, gross mistranslation, a gross, terrible mistranslation. And some of you might even know this off of your top of your head as the ruling on the issue. That you might have read, you might have heard that adoption is not allowed in Islam. Adoption is not permissible. I actually was looking through an early English translation, an early English seerah book that was actually written by a non-Muslim historian who wrote a book on the life of the Prophet And it said that the story of Zayd, the son of Haritha, later on it would be revealed in the Medinan period that adoption was no longer allowed or permissible in Islam. And that's what you might have heard, what you might have seen. That's absolutely incorrect. Absolutely incorrect. Adoption is permissible within Islam. It is allowed within Islam. And somebody could even argue that if it's in regards to a yatim, then it is actually recommended and a highly rewardable act. All right? The reason why this misunderstanding occurs is because of the Arabic terminology. The Arabic terminology is At-Tabanna, At-Tabanni. At-Tabanni basically means to make someone your son. But it comes from the word Ibn. Means to claim someone as your biological son. See, difference. The word Tabanni that people translated as adoption, and where it said, لا يجوز Tabanni في Islam. Tabanni is not permissible in Islam. They said adoption is not allowed in Islam. Wrong. Tabanni means to claim someone as your biological son is not allowed in Islam. Kafalatul Yatim, Kafalatul Yatim, which basically means to take care of an orphan, is a great rewardable act. Ana wa kafirul Yatim kahatain. The Prophet ﷺ said, Me and someone who takes care of an orphan, takes the responsibility of an orphan, are like these two, like these two fingers. That's the reward. That's the reward. So it depends on how we exactly translate. And adoption doesn't necessarily mean that you... In fact, the word adoption means that you are clearly... When you say someone is your adopted son, you are clearly saying he's not my biological son, he's my adopted son. So this is a lack of familiarity with the Arabic language or the English language. So the, some of the Orientalists who translated were not familiar with some of the Arabic terminology. And some people who translated it were not f fully familiar with the English language. And what, what did we end up with? We ended up with a big old mess. 
that we've basically been explaining. I, I, I remember this question being asked for the last 30 years growing up here in America, 30 plus years. But that's the ruling on the matter. So adoption is allowed, it's rewarding actually. It's, it's a rewardable act, it's a very noble effort. But not claiming someone as your biological son, that is not permissible. And later on when that command was revealed, then the Prophet ﷺ proclaimed, nobody calls Zayd, Zayd bin Muhammad anymore. His name is Zayd ibn Haritha, Zayd ibn Haritha, Zayd bin Haritha, Zayd the son of Haritha. And actually the narration says that Zayd anhu was so sad about not his name not being affiliated with the name of the Prophet ﷺ anymore. Of course, Qur'an is Qur'an, command of Allah is command of Allah. So he didn't argue, but he was just saddened that constantly the, the, he was associated with the Prophet ﷺ. That then he became known as Zayd Mawla Muhammad. Zayd Mawla Muhammad. Mawla basically was a term that would be used if you had a relationship with someone. If you had a very close family-like relationship with someone, somebody would be somebody's Mawla. And it's specifically in classical Arabic, in ancient Arabia, it would be used. If somebody freed a slave, if somebody freed a slave, then they would be known as each other's mawla. That they had a family-like relationship. He used to be a slave, he used to live in his house, he belonged to him. But when he freed him, now they would be known as each other's mawla. So Zayd mawla Muhammad, Zayd the close associate of the Prophet And that's what he became popularly known as. But that was the third person to accept Islam. But he was a slave at this time. So the narration as I was reading it, basically says that وَأَوَّلُ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ وَأَوَّلُ مَنْ أَسْلَمَ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ الْأَحْرَارِ أَبُو بَكَرْ الصِّدِّيقِ رضي الله عنه That the first one from the men, free men, to accept Islam was Abu Bakr رضي الله عنه. There are a lot of narrations in the classical books of hadith and seerah, which talk about, excuse me, which talk about Abu Bakr رضي الله عنه being the first one to accept Islam. And the reason this is, is because he was the first free man. I mean, he was the first public person. Everything else was in the home. Khadija the wife, Ali the boy living in the home, Zayd the slave. So the first person outside of the home was Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And that's why he is mentioned as the first one. وَإِسْلَامُهُ كَانَ أَنْفَعَ مِنْ إِسْلَامِ مَنْ تَقَدَّمَ ذِكْرُهُمْ And... The scholars, they write that his Islam was very, him accepting Islam was very beneficial to the religion at that time. إِذْ كَانَ صَدْرًا مُعَظَّمًا Because he was a leader of his people who was very respected. وَرَئِيسًا فِي قُرَيْشْ مُكَرَّمًا And he was, a, he, was, he was a prominent person who was respected. He was a leader amongst Quraysh who was honored and dignified. وَصَاحِبَ مَالٍ and he was actually a very wealthy person. وَدَاعِيَةً إِلَى الْإِسْلَامِ Not only that, but he was a very motivated caller to Islam. He was motivated to share the message of Islam with people. وَكَانَ مُحَبَّبًا مُتَأَلَّفًا And he was loved by the people. He was respected by the people. يَبْذُلُ الْمَالَ فِي طَاعَةِ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ And he would, he would later on go on to freely spend all of his money and all of his resources in the obedience of Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa Ibn Ishaq writes that literally a day or two after the Prophet sallallahu came back and this whole process started, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu laqi Rasul Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He met the Prophet ﷺ, فقال, أَحَقٌ مَا تَقُولُ قُرَيْشِ يَا مُحَمَّدْ مِنْ تَرْكِكَ, من تركك آلِهَتَنَا He says, is it true, O Muhammad, what Quraysh are saying about you leaving our idols? وَتَسْفِيهِكَ عُقُولَنَا And that you say that we are foolish for worshipping these idols? وَتَكْفِيرِكَ آبَاءَنَا And that you reject the religion of our forefathers? فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ بَلَا Of course. Absolutely. One other narration says that Abu Bakr told the Prophet ﷺ that what is it, O Muhammad, that I see you leaving the gatherings of our people. I haven't seen you coming to the meetings. I haven't seen you showing up to the council meetings. You seem to kind of be distant for a few days. What's going on with you? And that's when the Prophet ﷺ said, Inni Rasulullahi wa Nabiyuhu. I am the messenger of God and His Prophet. وَبَعَثَنِي لِيُبَلِّغَ رِسَالَتَهُ And he has sent me to spread and to deliver his message. وَأَدْعُوكَ إِلَى اللَّهِ بِالْحَقِّ And I call you to Allah with the truth. فَوَاللَّهِ إِنَّهُ لَلْحَقِّ Because I swear by God that is the truth. 
أَدْعُوكَ يَا أَبَا بَكْرٍ I call you, O Abu Bakr, إِلَى اللَّهِ وَحْدَهُ To Allah alone. لا شريك له There are no partners for him. ولا تعبد غيره And do not worship anyone other than him. والموالات على طاعته And basically relationships will be established based on the obedience to Allah. وَقَرَعَ عَلَيْهِ الْقُرْآنِ and then the Prophet ﷺ recited the Qur'an that was revealed to him, he recited it to Abu Bakr. فَلَمْ يُقِرَّ وَلَمْ يُنْكِرْ Abu Bakr رضي الله عنه did not hesitate nor did he reject. فَأَسْلَمَ وَكَفَرَ بِالْأَصْنَامِ He accepted Islam and he rejected the idols. وَخَلَعَ الْأَنْدَادَ وَأَقَرَّ بِحَقِّ الْإِسْلَامِ and he left all the idols, all those other things that people worshipped other than Allah. And he attested to the truth of Islam. وَرَجَعَ أَبُو بَكَرْ وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ مُصَدِّقٌ And he returned back from there a firm believer. The Prophet of Allah ﷺ says in many, in an authentic narration, that the Prophet ﷺ later on would tell the Muslims. When the Muslims were many, he would tell them, مَا دَعَوْتُ أَحَدًا إِلَى الْإِسْلَامِ Never ever did I call anyone to Islam. إِلَّا كَانَتْ عِنْدَهُ كَبْوَةٌ وَتَرَدُّدٌ وَنَظَرٌ Except that that person hesitated. That person thought. That person took some time. Let me sleep on it. Let me think about it. Let me chew on it. Anytime, anyone. Never did I, accept, did I invite anyone to Islam. Except they took some time to think about it, to process it. إِلَّا أَبَا بَكْرٍ Except for Abu Bakr. مَا عَكَمَ عَنْهُ حِينَ ذَكَرْتُهُ He did not back away from it when I mentioned it to him. وَلَا تَرَدَّدَ فِيهِ Nor did he have any doubts in it. He did not wait a moment, nor did he doubt what I was telling him. And part of the reason for this, part of the reason, the first reason for this is, this is why he's Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. This is a level of faith that he had. This is the level of iman of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. A second factor, that cannot be ignored. Because see, part of uh, the objective here in this seerah, in this cr uh, chronicling of the seerah, is to humanize the Prophet ﷺ. We have to understand, I talked about it in the childhood of the Prophet ﷺ, that there are narrations that tell us about the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr anhu being very good friends as early as when they were 10 years old. They had known each other for 30 plus years. They were best friends. So if anyone knew the Prophet ﷺ, it was Abu Bakr ﷺ. You know, one way you could say, well, he was his best friend, of course he's gonna accept. But at the same time, at the same time, you know, like we see politicians today, when we see politicians today, they try to create and craft an identity for them, a campaign for them. All right, we got this in the past that we got to kind of cover up and we got this and we got to highlight this and we got to build this campaign and we got to build this identity around this. You know how we craft personalities, craft identities, market people. But if the Prophet ﷺ had something to hide, if he was lying, if he was making this up, then what would actually serve his purpose and serve his benefit was to actually be distant, kind of shy away. You know when somebody who becomes very prominent and somebody shows up and maybe they have something to hide in their past and somebody from their past shows up, they get very nervous and very worried. They get really concerned, like, oh man, this guy knows me, like he knows me, me. He knows the real me. But the Prophet of Allah is seeking out the people who know him best. He didn't have anything to hide. In fact, the whole life, his whole life that he had lived up to this point, this 40, the first 40 years of his life were a testament to the truth of his message. They were evidence of the fact of him being a Prophet. And his best friend, who would know him better than his best friend, who had known him for over 30 years, knew him as a child, knew him as a teenager, knew him as a youngster, knew when he got married, knew when he had his first child. Did, knew him when he first started doing business. Traveled with him, did business with him. Who would know him better than that? Nobody. In the second he hears, he believes. Because he said, this makes total sense. This makes total sense. Your character, your nobility, your akhlaq, and secondly, you've never lied ever before. If anybody knew a, a little white lie that you might have told, it would be me. But even as a child, I can't remember you lying. I have no reason to doubt you. He believed instantly. And that was a major factor in Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu accepting Islam immediately and accepting Islam the way he accepted Islam. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is a narration in Sahih Bukhari, narrated by Abu Darda radiallahu anhu, 
where it tells a story about Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu having a dispute with Umar radiallahu anhu. And that's something that's normal. That's, that's perfectly normal. People who work in close proximity with each other, people that are around each other a lot, will disagree on matters. So they had some type of dispute, disagreement on a matter. That was brought before the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet of Allah ﷺ said, "Inna Allah ba'athani ilaykum. Allah sent me to y'all. He He sent me as a prophet and a messenger to y'all. فَقُلْتُمْ كَذَبْتَ And what did y'all say to me? Y'all responded to me by saying, "You lie." وَقَالَ أَبُو بَكْرَ صَدَقَ But Abu Bakr said he speaks the truth. I was sent by Allah as a prophet and a messenger to all of y'all. And all of y'all said, you lie. Abu Bakr said, he speaks the truth. And he supported me. He aided me with his life and with his money. So now will you, be, will you basically treat him badly? My friend, he called him my best friend. You will treat my best friend, my companion badly now? That the Prophet ﷺ was basically saying that, no, 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 you give him the respect he deserves. You disagree with him, disagreements are fine. But you give him the respect that he deserves. And it's very, very important. And the Prophet ﷺ basically spoke on his behalf. Marratain. And then the Prophet ﷺ said this two times. فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ تَارِكُوا لِي صَاحِبِي فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ تَارِكُوا لِي صَاحِبِي فَمَا أُوذِيَ بَعْدَهَا And nobody ever used to ever misbehave with Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu from that day on. Because he understood how, how close he was to the Prophet and what he meant to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this basically talks about Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu accepting Islam. I'll end today's session with something that Hassan Radiallahu anhu. In the next session, actually, the story of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu accepting Islam is not complete. It's not over. It'll have to carry on into the next following session because there's a major incident that took place. There's a major, major incident that took place because Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was not only the first free man to accept Islam, he was also the first one to go public with his Islam. And when he when he went public with his Islam, something major and drastic occurred. And there's also the detail of what Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu did the first two days that he was Muslim. There's a beautiful story about what he did the first two days he was Muslim. So we'll talk all about all of that in the following session. But what I'd like to end with today is what Hassan bin Thabit radiallahu anhu says. This is preserved in the Diwan of Hassan, who is a great Sahabi of the Prophet Sallallahu He's a poet. What he says about Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he says, "Ida ta dakarta shajwan min akhi thiqatin, fadkur akhak Abu Bakrin bima faala. Khair al bariyati awfaha wa aadalaha baad al Nabi." وأولاها بما حملا وتالي أثاني المحمود مشهده وأول الناس منهم صدق الرسل عاش حميدا لأمر الله متبعا بأمر صاحبه الماضي ومن تقلا. He says that if you want to remember sacrifice, if you want to recall sacrifice, and you want to recall belief and and bravery, then remember my brother Abu Bakr. Meaning talk about him and what he did. He was the best of people, and he was the most trustworthy of people, and he was the most just and fair of the people after the Prophet ﷺ. And he was the first one to carry what the Prophet ﷺ had brought. He was the first one to line up behind the Prophet ﷺ, the second of the two in the cave, the one that was praised by Allah and His Messenger ﷺ, and the one who stood by the side of the Prophet ﷺ throughout prophethood. And he was the first one amongst the people to attest to him being a messenger and a prophet. He lived a life that was very praiseworthy, and he followed the command of Allah and he followed the command of his companion the Prophet Muhammad after he was gone and living according to Allah and his command did he leave this world and depart from this world these are the virtues and this is the praise of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us his 
noble qualities. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to believe in the way He believed. Inshallah, we'll go ahead and end today's session here. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashadu la ilaha illa anta nasakhfirka wa natubu ilayk. Um, I know I keep making reference to previous sessions. If someone would like to find them, download them, listen to them, you can find them on the Qalam Institute website, qalaminstitute.org slash podcast. Jazakumullah khair.